for anyone listening, Jeff, for Jeff, can you just let us know your background <laughs> with like how you got into like reggae um, and kind of your personal connection to that and why you write in uh, with that influence? Oh, me? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so I grew up in Florida. Um, I grew up um, around a lot of Haitians, around a lot of Jamaicans, West Indians. And reggae was always playing in our kitchen, always playing in our house. And so reggae was like, I, it was like my gospel music, you know, you know, mm-hmm. when you grow up, I don't know if you, you know, a lot of people grow up in like Christian homes and stuff. They'll hear church music all the time. So reggae was like my church music. Um, and um, so, and also, um, it was the first time I ever heard of of a black man being uh, deified, Haile Selassie, the king of Ethiopia. I don't even know where Ethiopia was at. That was my next fascinated. question because I saw you. You've brought up, you've written the the name Selassie a couple times. I was like, who was that? Was going to be my next question, but it sounds like you're sounds like you're there already. Please elaborate on that. Yeah, Haile Selassie is. He was a king, and he was king of Ethiopia from 1914 through 1971. He is considered to be the 225th descendant of King Solomon and Queen Sheba, uh, who's mentioned in the Bible a couple of times. Um, She was a queen of Ethiopia in the 10th century. She traveled to Israel, had an affair with Solomon. They had a lineage of kings that came back to Ethiopia from that. So I've been fascinated because uh, Rastafarianism is basically a black pride type of uh, idea that hails Ethiopia as a free state in Africa that resisted colonialism colonialization. So Ethiopia in general is considered to be a symbol of resistance uh, from colonization. But in addition to that, I was fascinated because Ethiopia is also the cradle of humanity, right? So our species evolved in the Great Rift Valley in Ethiopia. So um, is the birthplace of man, essentially, birthplace of the species of hominids, all of different forms of hominids, over 25 different species of hominids. So I was interested in that, but I was also interested in holding on to something that gives me dignity. Um, mm. I'm half white. My mother's from Sicily. And my father, who I really never met, is from the West Indies. So... I was interested in holding on to something that gives me dignity um, and kind of black pride. And I found Rastafarianism that talks about the king of Ethiopia um, so much so that I grew my dreadlocks and I grew my dreadlocks in medical school. And what happens is when you grow your dreads, when you grow dreads, um, they look pretty weird to people. And what happens is people start rejecting you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that as they're rejecting you, you're forced to look inward for your own dignity, for your own kind of self-acceptance. But I took it a step further because that's what Michael Bell does. I (laughs) took it a little step further. So I decided that um, I'm going to grow my dreads to uh, actually go to the Great Rift Valley, which I did. I grew my dress all through school, college, and medical school. I, the day after I graduated medical school, the day after I, I was on Ethiopian Airlines and I flew to Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, and I cut my dress there and I buried them in the Great Rift Valley. Damn, as a kind of a, as a way of kind of like returning. Mm. Um, so Rastafarianism to me is basically a symbol of. Um, a symbol of dignity, 
and also it kind of reminds me of the um, impermanence of a species, how species comes and goes. And the way I kind of think about Rastafarianism and Ethiopia and human evolution, all that stuff, it helps me stay out of the details of day-to-day life. Um, When I get worried about something, I just remembered that the species is going to die off in a million years anyway. Mm. I think about deep time. So I, t- I tend to write about things that <clears throat> are long past or long in the future. Uh, mm. Rarely I think about stuff happening today because I like to think about deep time, long history, um, because I, I find it more interesting, more fun. Um, so like you mentioned, I, I'm writing a song about the Shawnee Indians that lived about 10,000 years ago in Ohio. I'm in Ohio right now. Mm-hmm. The Shawnee are not here anymore, but they lived here for 10,000 years. Um, are they, Ohio they is only have, in Ohio uh, for about 200 years, right? And so the Shawnee has been here 10,000 years in Ohio. People think Ohio is Ohio, but really that's kind of new. Really it's Shawnee land. 10,000 years has passed, you know? So I like thinking about deep time. And I think the common denominator for me is about dignity and about kind of thinking about your place in the grand scheme of a vast, vast universe. Our, Dude, our, that, our one yeah. l- listener, Jeff Robinson, uh, he's the guy that I'm approaching to sing the Shawnee song. Um, he he's His background is uh, half African-American, half Native American. So, awesome. um, uh, when you were talking about your story of like bear, going to Ethiopia to bury your dreads, like, dude, that's such like a, that's like a poetic moment. Like that's just begging to be in a song. So I hope you write a song, just like no frills, just say what you did and it'll be awesome. Oh, I didn't even think about that. That's a great idea. You don't even need to embellish it or anything. Like just talk about well, literally what you just said to us. It'll be amazing. Um, I'm, I'm so glad you said that because when I think about like uh, moments that I've transcended in my life, that was one moment that I was floating out there in the universe somewhere when I did that. I still remember the scene and everything, the smell of the ground, everything. It was really a spiritual thing. I didn't think it would be a big deal. Like I thought it would just be symbolic. But when I actually did it, it was really powerful. I remember it. It really was one of those things that... Um, that you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna hold on to. Write about it, the smell and everything, and then let us get our hands on it so we can make good music out of it. Um, Keep it to yourself say- and let it be your own mm-hmm. dignity and your own heart. Whatever, whatever floats your boat, man. Um, I just want to say two other things about Ethiopia because I feel like it's been like coming up in my life actually. Because uh, I'm like a low energy person. I drink a bunch of coffee and it gives me energy in life. And awesome. I recently, I was watching uh, like modern marvels on coffee and apparently coffee was oh. discovered in Ethiopia. It's, yeah. A town called Kaffa. I've been there. Uh, yeah. Sweet man. And then it crossed into Yemen and kind of went up uh, the middle East that way. So that was something I was thinking about Ethiopia recently. And then the other thing is um, it's interesting. You mentioned there's like a connection with King Solomon and Israel because uh, in one of my other nerdy mystical ad- adventures on the internet, there's a, uh, there's actually a pretty strong claim that the Ark of the Covenant is in Ethiopia. Excellent. Um, and so there, there's like a whole history of like, first, when I first heard, I was like, what the fuck? Like, what does that, what does Ethiopia have to do with like Israel and stuff? And then there's actually like a pretty strong connection. And there's these cool stories of like these kind of monks who guard it. And like, uh, I get, the le- some the story that I read was like that they develop like cataracts because whatever the Ark of the Covenant is is like either radiation or has some like some type of energy that like can fuck with your eyes. But um, yeah, the the point is I'm saying Ethiopia uh, has has come into my mind recently as having just being a super interesting place. So I didn't know it had a connection to <clears throat> Rastafarianism. That's interesting too. How did how did it get from Ethiopia and how did uh uh the King Selassie stuff travel to cuz so uh Jamaica is the birthplace of reggae 
right? So how does how does it travel from uh, Ethiopia, and then how does it get into the culture and into the music? Um, so Marcus Garvey was a preacher in 1940s. He created a um, movement called um, basically back to Africa movement. It's called the African um, Organization Unit, OAU. And um, he basically was considered to be a prophet. He's from actually the same town that Bob Marley's from, Mm. same town that Bernie Spears from. Same town that Joseph Hills from all these amazing reggae artists, um, and he basically prophesied, look towards Africa, there will be a crowning of a king, and I think in 1933 or 32, um, Haile Selassie uh, was crowned king of Ethiopia around that time, right before World War One, or right after World War One. I'm sorry. Um, so when that happened. Um, people started to call themselves Rasta in the 30s and 40s in in, um, Jamaica. And one group called the 12 Tribe of Israel uh, became basically a religious cult um, with Haile Selassie as their god. Mm -hmm. It it has evolved over the last 90, 80 years to different sects. But basically, the, the common theme is um Africans are more than workers or slaves. Uh, people of dark skin come from a rich heritage, a rich land, an ancient, timeless, um, beyond measure, deep time um, land, um, original land, the birthplace of the species, and it goes beyond written language. So it's, it's basically a, um, just like maybe Jewish people look at um, Israel or people from Islam look at Mecca, you know, Mecca. Mm-hmm. It's considered to be kind of a symbol now, I think, more so than the land itself. Um, but to me, it's beyond that um, because Rastafarianism is basically 100 years old, basically. But if you take it a step further, um, you know, one fundamental question I kind of think about is what does it mean to be good? And then what does it mean to be um, human? What does it mean to be a good human? What does it mean to uh, be a part of nature? Um so all of that starts in the Great Rift Valley. And if you want to even go deeper than that, the Great Rift Valley is essentially a tragedy. It was filled with volcanoes and earthquakes. It tore up vast forest land. And if you want to take a step further than that, because of the tragedy of all these volcanoes that happened about 2 million years ago, he created these vast savannas. And these mm. bananas is the very thing that made man made hominids start to go upright, right? So we can start to use our hands. And the moment you start to become bipedal, use your hands, you have the access, you have the ability to um, have greater um, access to bone marrow and to meat. You develop a frontal lobe. So it's crazy how one thing led to the one thing led to the other. I mean, uh, sometimes people think, well, that doesn't matter, but I'll give you two analogies. Um, Usually when there's a bedroom, it's always on the second floor, right? Mm -hmm. Because we evolved from species that slept in trees, Mm. right? People all around the world eat eggs in the morning, right? You know why? I did. That why? Because mammals, even before humans, would steal reptile eggs while reptiles were still sleeping. Because reptiles don't warm up until noon, right? Because they get warmed up by the sun. 
Mm. So we, as lower mammals, would steal eggs in the morning um, and eat eggs in the morning um, because it was a really, really easy energy source. Pretty so bogus st- of those early mammals, though, to be honest. Kind of a, kind of a cheap <laughs> shot on reptiles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, like, people, when they eat eggs in the morning, they don't really think it's a choice, but it comes from this deep time. <clears throat> when I go to, to sleep upstairs... I don't think about I'm a monkey sleeping up in a tree. I just think about it makes sense for the bedroom to be upstairs, you know? Um, so like all this stuff comes from deep time. And um, I mean, so the way I think about it with reggae is just, for me, reggae is just a kind of a reminder of this deep time, this deep kind of mystical evolution of going forward and backwards. You, you use like sometimes you use uh, Greek mythology. Is that is that right? In in some of your songwriting, like with the Achilles fought Hector, is that that's from Greek mythology, right? Mm-hmm. And wh- where does that come in? Uh, well, I, I like the um, I like universal themes. So mm-hmm. universal themes, but I think about like what's what's some common denominators for Homo sapiens. The first common denominator of Homo sapiens and mammals in general is war. You know, we're a warring species. We mm-hmm. we war with each other. Um, you know, if you look at chimpanzees, they war with other chimpanzees. They murder other chimpanzees. It's a vicious war, usually, with hominids in, gen- in general. So I think about war and the, what does war mean. Um and I don't think about it like in a judgmental fashion. I think about it in a just, you know, natural experience that we war. Behavioral, yeah. Yeah, and war, there's so much, uh, there's so much like beauty in war and there's so much like pain and suffering in war. It's such a, such a dichotomy of a human experience, war. Like war could be just, war can be like this amazing thing and it could be also like, such a great tragedy. Um, and it seems like we war regardless of ideology. Um, there hasn't been anything that has stopped us from warring with each other. Um, so even in our mythology, we war with each other. Um, even in love, we war with each other. Families war with each other. Um, brother war against brother um so it seems like even love sometimes can't stop war Mm -hmm. or sometimes people go to war because of love i think that's interesting um the irony in that so um achilles was just a like a classic example of achilles going to war to fight hector and the only reason achilles is going to fight hector is because hector killed achilles main man so I kind of thought about it. Oh man, I've seen that before in Miami, Florida, when mm-hmm. a gang member kill, kills another brother from another hood. They're going to go to war. Mm-hmm. They don't care about you know legal punishment. If you kill my man, I'm going to kill you. And it makes sense back then, and it's still true. And people believe that, and they do that. They feel that. So if you kill my main man, I'm going to kill you. And it seems like people will feel right in that thinking. And I thought about it to myself. I seen that in Boys in the Hood, but Achilles did that like mm-hmm. thousands of years ago, right? <laughs> Achilles was like the original Boys in the Hood, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I thought that was crazy. Like um, the king told Achilles to let's go fight the Trojans, and Achilles was like, "No, nah, I'm not really feeling it." And Achilles was just hanging out, having sex with random people in the in the camp everyone else was fighting and Achilles was like I'm not going to war yet but the moment Hector killed his, his main man then he said oh shit it's, it's on now you know <laughs> you know I'm going to go to war now Michael so, Bell yeah. it sounds like you're proposing maybe like a new Hollywood movie where it's just the story of Achilles fighting and killing Hector but it takes place in you know That's Detroit 2020 2021 maybe 
but you keep the same names and maybe oh no i'm ripping this off did, wasn't there a, a romeo and juliet that did that yeah, yeah. modern day romeo and juliet in, in the 90s they they uh they had yep. what's his face Claire Danes and leo That's yeah him. yeah I was going to ask where in Florida Michael Bell was at Miami area because I, I lived there for two years. Yeah, I lived in Carroll City. Where is that? It's like 123rd. It's just like it goes up to like 333rd Street in Carroll City. Okay. Yeah, near the old Dolphin Stadium. Okay. <clears throat> Where do you live, Jana? Um, I lived in Coral Gables area, so kind of by Miracle Mile. Oh, that's nice. Kind of near, uh, like, I think, isn't Cali Ocho the one that goes right towards Miami Beach and South Miami, right? That's so kind of... So beautiful, so green. Yeah, it was, it was pretty, because I, I had to live near campus i went to u miami so and i worked at the biltmore hotel for like three months and then i worked at uh, miami dade mall and the cine bistro <laughs> went from like one extreme of serving to another it was it was fun but it was intense i was pretty uh broke that two years that i lived there you know i think florida is important at least in my evolution because for me um I've always was, uh, you know, those old Indiana Jones movies when, like, the red line would like when they, when India was traveling, they would, they would show like a red mm. line going to China, yep. Japan, like these faraway places. So I've always been fascinated with like uh, things far away, um, like either in space or time. Mm-hmm. Um, I've always been fascinated with just like deep culture and stuff. I've always wanted just to go away from Florida and go to like ancient places and you know. The one road trip that I took when I was living in Miami was to New Orleans and it was the second time I had been there but I I that's why it's exactly why I love New Orleans cuz it just feels like a different realm. Oh my god, New Orleans is so amazing. Amazing. Right? It's like my favorite place. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Man, I feel so under traveled. <laughs> Y'all have been everywhere. Well, you know, um, uh, like uh, uh, my job in college, um, I worked in the library, and I was in charge of um, <clears throat> organizing the world religion section of books. Mm-hmm. So I had like one row of about like 2,000 books. And I just made it a personal goal to myself to like try to read all those books in two years um, my contract was for two years in that library and that's the way i travel really in those books and that's how i became familiar with like these ancient places um so i traveled in my mind way before i actually saw these places some of these places how, how far did you get with the book with the book amount i read every single one of them oh really all two thousand that's a lot God, two man. years man that's tough. I really like these it's, uh, John Muir's essays from when he was like traveling around the United States. And basically, like, you see him go to all the national parks, like, before they're national parks. <laughs> basically, like, you, you could see, like, Teddy Roosevelt was like, oh, John, John Muir went here? Make it a national park. <laughs> Write that down. <laughs> Yeah, I love I love it because then I'll read read what he wrote, and then um, like he describes it in a certain way, and so you have this like whole mental picture. And then I'll look up like pictures online to see if like, and sometimes it matches up like so perfectly, so exactly, and then sometimes it's just so different from whatever you had put in your brain. And I don't know, there's there's like something to be said there about. Uh, like when that jives and when it when it doesn't just like i don't know someone could get into the deep metaphorical uh space about that uh yeah and you know i i think to myself um when i think to myself like 
Uh, I'm the first person in my family to um, graduate high school. No one in my family ever graduated high school before me. Hmm. Um, most of my cousins and family members have been to prison or been shot or died prematurely, including my brother. Um, so I, I think, you know, I'm not so special. So I, I think to myself, like, what allowed me to go to the Great Rift Valley versus my cousin and my brother who's dead now? And if there's anything that I can think that uh, get, kind of vaccinated me from that experience, it was just the power of an idea. And ideas came to me through books, mm. through ideologies, through just being aware of different ways of thinking. Um, and that's one reason I thought to myself, psychiatry would be good because psychiatry is essentially, and also music, I think, and art in general is just injecting an idea. Um, and when you inject an idea into a substrate, crazy things can happen, sometimes good, sometimes bad. Um, but at least it's a departure from the mundane, right? I knew if I go to the Great Rift Valley, tragedy could await me there. <laughs> I don't know. I could have, I don't know what mm -hmm. could have happened there. But it would have, one thing for sure, going to the Great Rift Valley. You don't leave the Great Wood Valley the same. You know, something happens in that exchange. And I'm always willing to bet on introducing an idea with the idea that um, is going to cause something to happen. How did, how did you, uh, were, were you reading a lot when you were in high school and things like that? Like, uh, did you start, like, you're more kind of spiritual research or quest back then like you were talking about the difference between your brother and your cousin like were you more interested in kind of bigger ideas um than other people you knew that were maybe your peers or whatnot um uh, not really but uh, two things one thing is I hated stepping on crack pipes. Mm -hmm. Like I would walk to school and I would step on a crack pipe and it will, it, it cracks under your feet. And I hated that because it kind of symbolizes to me like, like great despair. Like what the fuck? I'm stepping on a crack pipe. Mm -hmm. 13 years old. There shouldn't be a crack pipe here. I knew that. Yeah. Going to school, like, man, that's, that's taking away my fucking innocence, right? Stepping on a crack pipe. 13 years old. So I knew I had great disdain for that. And the way I summed that up is I hated dumb shit. I hated dumb stuff. Mm -hmm. Stepping on a crack pipe is dumb. You know, it was like, oh my God, that's so stupid, right? So I had, I grew a great disdain for like dumb stuff. Like when you say dumb, does that mean like ignorant? It just ig ignorant. Okay. So that could be, I guess that's a pretty wide range of, of behaviors or. It's like most of human beings, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, for real. It is. Yeah. So a, I, I, I try, to, try to differentiate myself from dumb stuff like that. It's hard. It's crazy like, how sometimes... different experiences people have though. Cause I can't really to, I can't, that's like a crazy experience to me. Like being 13 and stepping on a crack pipe is insane. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, but the crack pipe is like a symbol for other dumb stuff, right? Like, you know, like uh, like the 7-Eleven had like 98-ounce drinks. That's kind of like a <laughs> crack pipe too, you know? Like, Slurpees. <laughs> yeah, Jesus. I mean, like you can take out a crack pipe and put whatever dumb stuff from your own world, you know? Uh so I, I, I just try to read people that I kind of respected. I thought, oh, this is, he must be good over here. He's talking about this ancient philosophy. At least that's better than, you know, talking about some dumb stuff. As I got deeper into it, I realized some philosophy is pretty dumb too. I'm pretty, you know, crack pipe-ish 
too. But, you know, at least I learned to differentiate that stuff. So basically, my goal was to have my dignity because I felt like my dignity was uh, being uh, threatened at every angle at that age um, in different ways, in subtle ways, you know. So um, I was trying to hold on to that um, in various means. And I didn't know that was making me evolve further from different people, from other, from others. Um, so that was my main motivation. My main motivation was to, you know, I keep my beauty, what I felt was beautiful, like maintain my dignity in the in the face of like um, people not respecting your dignity. Um, that was my main motivation to resist despair. Mm-hmm. You know. I remember like um, when I was 14, I was walking home from school and it was like a pretty good day in my world. I just got home from baseball practice. We got home early from baseball practice. The coach let us off a little early and I was walking home feeling pretty good. <clears throat> and I remember I saved some cornflakes in the, in the refrigerator and had, I had my name on. I was like, I'm going to go home and tear those cornflakes up. I was like feeling pretty good about it. And a car drove past me, and and a guy like spit on me, and it like ruined my day. Like, like I still like kind of remember like someone just like drove by and spit on me. And I couldn't tell like what color they were or who they were. It was, mm-hmm. just, it was really bizarre, and it affected me. And I went home and I wrote some poetry about it. I kind of wrote it out. Um, and I remember I was struggling, like I wanted to give in to despair, like, man, that's messed up. You know, why was someone do that? And then I was like, writing, like, no, don't give in to that. Don't give in to like um, them trying to make you feel less than who you were. Like, you, you know, remember you come from a species that evolved from a place far away from here. Um, your species circled the globe multiple times you know like you're part of that species your species was able to um deduce that when birds fly that way it's going to get cold soon Uh, your species was the same species that was able to create a clove spear that created language you know that scaled you know glaciers you know, so I try to remember that dignity as a way to remember, like, stupid Florida people spitting on you, you know, spitting on a kid. You know? Yeah. What do you think causes that, like, the opposite reaction of, like, growing up sort of in the bullshit and then just, like, what makes you be the guy that that is in the car instead of the kid walking home? Like, I, you know, that that's what's always been, like, confusing to me you know like yeah I I don't know like when people just do things that seem to be you know like there's that saying like people do things out of the goodness of their heart but it's like what does that what does the opposite come from you know like you know I thought to myself I probably spit on someone in my life I, I mean not literally spit on them but I probably treated someone badly myself and and maybe was only partially aware that I did that or maybe I was fully aware but I've treated people like like messed up in different ways in my life too so I've been guilty of like um, causing someone to soul search their own dignity because of my own kind of stupid stupidity so I've probably been that other person too at some point and I'm sure that person that spit on me, someone spit on that person too, right? Um, I mean, Achilles doesn't go to war for no reason, you know? Um, someone like hurt Achilles. Um, and Hector hurt Achilles' best friend because, I mean, Achilles, uh, Hector didn't do it for no reason either, you know? Do you think... Um it's weird, like all of these parallels with like uh, humanity as a whole and like just people's individual experiences where like you talked about the Rift Valley undergoing like 
So like volcanoes and geological, like violent uh, upheavals and stuff. And from that, you know, it was able to create the savannas that nurtured human life. Whereas like people oftentimes, like in your case, you got straight up spit on other people might get some like hardships or metaphorical, you know, volcanoes blowing up in their lives that like uh, lead them to change in like other ways that I always, I always like heard stuff like that. And like from an outside perspective, now listening, I'm like, Oh, I could almost see like having gratitude for like some shitty moment in your life. But I haven't, I haven't actually been able to do that. I'm still like a little bitter, bitter Betty whenever something happens to me. Like, even if I grow from it, I'm like, nah, no, fuck that. Like I'm still, that was painful. I think you can grow from something and not have, and you know, like have resentment for for it or toward it, but still know that like ultimately you learn something from it. You know, like be grateful for it and not not be happy that it happened. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think uh, um, there's great beauty in maintaining your dignity when you suffer and we all suffer in different ways and we suffer greatly. That's one, another common denominator of homo sapiens of all, of all sentinel creatures, they all suffer. Um, but what's kind of beautiful is the idea that you can suffer and be Clint Eastwood, you know, like Clint Eastwood, someone comes up to Clint Eastwood and says, Hey man, the bandits are coming to town. <laughs> and Clint Eastwood says, "Well, today's going to be a good day to die." You know, he he shows bravery and kind of dignity, and doesn't resist and doesn't give in to like a uh, despair or straight up fear. Maybe he fears a little bit, but he shakes it off and just kind of faces the nature of our experience. I like that idea that we have that choice that we could give in to despair. People have given to despair. I've given it to despair at certain moments. And I'm not judging people who do that. We can understand why people give in to despair. But we watch movies where people don't do that. They don't give in to despair. And we love that. You know, we watch movies about it. We we love to see people like run towards the onslaught or whatever's happening. Um and I, I see that a lot of my daily practice in psychiatry. Usually I see patients who are pretty depressed, sometimes suicidal, um, and they want to be happy. And I tell them I don't sell happiness. What I sell is bravery and dignity. And if you want some of that, then I can help you get that. And if you can get that, usually you are also happy. But really the selling point is I know how to hold on to your dignity and I know how to hold on to your little small bravery that you probably still have. And if you can hold on to that, usually you have a content life, but I don't really sell happiness. I'm not about really, I'm not about happiness because happiness is kind of flaky to me and it comes and goes. It's but bravery, dignity, you can always have a little bit of that. I found that that's pretty true in life. The like, the sort of like high flying happiness, like the nature of it itself is sort of fleeting. You got to find that sort of like contentment. And I think dig- dignity is like the perfect word. Do you know what's uh, weird too? I was thinking about while you were talking about, um, I mean, it was from a couple of minutes when we were talking about this, the spitter guy. It's like when, when we've all probably been the spitter, it's like it never feels like you're never feels like you're doing something bad like like the spitter isn't like hey hey, look at me the villain gonna fuck up some little kid's day today like i'm the bad guy like well i don't know about that scenario but like i just know when i was doing when i've done bad stuff or like hurt people and i've always thought i was either like righteously doing it or like it didn't matter or it was like mm, something like that it it never it, it never feels like you're really spitting the the spitter story reminded me of like uh i i wouldn't be surprised if there was just another teenager in the car spitting on some younger teenager because 
that's, you know, like this kind of like power trip thing or just kind of some stupid shit that, you know, teenage boys in particular do. I remember I was recording this, this emo band and, uh, it was, it was a bunch of, uh, like 17, 18 year olds or something like that. And one of them worked at Qdoba and, uh, they, they went and picked up dude after work and, and he just got, he got like a shit ton of burritos for everyone and they just had too many and they 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 were just driving around and there's just some person walking and they're like dude throw throw the burrito out the window at him and they're like all right and then they just like they took off the wrapper and they whipped the burrito and they thought that the burrito was going to explode or something like that and it, they said that the dude was walking and the burrito just hit and then just like fell down in just one piece and it, they were just like really disappointed at the the lack of <laughs> You know, like burrito or explosion. Yeah, should have tried yeah, the water just, balloon. Just, I happen to know just, that when you whip a water balloon at a bystander's <laughs> head, um, yeah. it hits them in the head, explodes, and it fucking hurts. Yeah, random it, punk ass bitches who did that to me on the east side of Milwaukee at two a.m. I fucking see you. I see you. Fucking yeah, hate crime, my ass. You you get you got hit with a Stop water hate balloon. Crime. Well, I hated it. <laughs> I can't prove it was a hate crime, but I was with my girlfriend. <laughs> sure. So I'm saying it was because I hated it, and my first thought was, "Don't open your eyes or your mouth, because what the fuck is in that balloon?" Right. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. sorry. I just who knows what was in the burrito. I just got like launched back in time for some reason. The burrito story really just. I've just been thinking for the last however many minutes about Brett not knowing he's a villain, and I just want to call him Bitter Bready. Bitter Betty. No, Betty. bitter. Oh, bitter Bready. Bitter Bready. Yeah, that's, that's gonna be your villain name from now on. I have okay, so I have uh, kind of building up that I have a. Uh, more philosophical question from Michael Bell to <laughs> answer maybe. It's like this is why I, I mean I like to just by why I struggle with this. I just like to like think about stuff and not really act on I don't know. I just I'm more of like a I've always just felt comfortable playing with ideas. And when you start bringing it into the real world, I get super unconfident about it because No the, um, you Yeah. And so like the because I, I always think like, uh, how do I know that I'm not like spitting, like like because of because of what it looks like in hindsight or what it looks like from other people's perspective, like it, it's just always been a blurry thing where like I, I like you know being morally right is always something I'm like I don't know what that like I'm I don't know what objectively that means you know to like how do I know I'm not just spitting on people and thinking I'm doing some really amazing work for humanity yeah um i uh i've given up on the words right wrong so long ago um i've given up on the words um good good versus bad um, the words I kind of hold on to is, um, meaningful and meaningless. Um, and I think if you're seeking to have meaningful experiences, um, that leads you to a path that at the end of your life you're going to be content with how you lived. Um, and along that journey, um, I think you're going to do some things that are meaningless, but in the time you thought it was meaningful to you based on your evolution, but it didn't have much meaning or it was based on your ego. It was based on some uh, temporary pleasure or temporary need that you had. Um, and you know, we're, uh, uh, we are not gods and we don't have all the answers to a greater universe. Um, 
we're all trying to feel our way in a dark, dark cave. So um, along the path, you're going to hurt people. You're going to hurt yourself. Sometimes both at the same time. Um, but I judge people by their intent. If their intent is that they're trying to live meaningful lives, um, I can forgive a lot with that. You know, if their intent is that they're giving in to their, um, if they're giving in to their handicaps and not showing any type of bravery with facing their suffering, I considered that to be maybe a minor path. Um, but, um, you know, th that's kind of a superficial way of thinking about it. A deeper way of thinking about it is um, species come and go. There's a great reggae song that I love called uh, uh, Kingdoms Rise and Kingdom Falls by the Whalers. So kingdoms come and kingdoms go. Species come and they go. Um, and as species are living out their existence, they're doing awful things to each other. You know, they're, they're warring, they're raping, they're pillaging, they're doing all sorts of crazy stuff to each other. Um, they have their basic needs, they have their drives. Maybe 1% they have these higher kind of ideas that they're striving towards, but kingdoms rise and they fall with great ambitions, great hopes, great um, tenets. Sometimes they live up to them or sometimes they live up to them temporarily and then they fall. So, you know, if, if I had like judge Brett's life, let's say you live another 20 years or 30 years and then I, I'm like speaking at your funeral and I had to judge your life, I would judge your life based on was he in pursuit of meaningful experiences and producing meaning for other people or was he being an, an ass and giving in to stepping on crack pipes, you know, um, or was he trying to be the person that was at least sweeping the crack pipes away a little bit, you know, like, you know, so let's sweep them away so the nine-year-olds won't step on them. You know, the person that's sweeping away the crack pipe, he's not like an angel or she's not like an angel. They probably did bad stuff too. But at least on that day, they were sweeping away a crack pipe. And, you know, I can be proud of that. Um, so. So you'd uh, have like forgiveness and understand. What if they were sweeping away crack pipes like into the sewer or something, and then the crack got in the water and killed a whole bunch of people. Like that would be, I mean, it sounds like a joke, but it's like, it's not like, well, because they, because they had the intent of cleaning up the crack pipes, it would still, I, 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 I can forgive that because of the universal law of impermanence. Um, they have to die. They're going to die from a crack pipe or something else. Um, fish have to die, oceans have to die, worlds have to die, kingdoms have to die. We all have to die. We don't get to live forever. Kingdoms don't get to live forever. Species don't get to live forever. So whether they die from a crack pie or a vegan burrito, they're going to die. <laughs> One way or the other. Right. Whether they get hit in the head with a vegan burrito on the side of the street, <laughs> a water balloon, yep. spit with fungus in the spit, something, yep. they're going to die. Um, but, uh, if I had to judge myself or judge another person, I would judge them by them holding on to their dignity and showing bravery, not so much being a good person. I would just say, I kind of like, I'm rooting for people who are brave and I'm rooting for people who are maintaining their dignity, even though, even though they may have to step on a crack pipe or two here and there. Like, the, the meaningless... um, there's going to be other people that's going to get hit with a water balloon, right? Um, but you can call she's here on this podcast. She is not letting that water balloon destroy her life, right? right? She's here right now showing bravery despite that water balloon to the face three in the morning, right? And, yeah, so, sometime early in the morning. That's awesome. <laughs>
It, it, what's interesting is that the the meaningless also leads to meaningful things, right? So someone spits on you when you're 14 and you hold that to this day and it kind of shaped you in certain ways, right? So that that action is something that would be deemed meaningless, but in reality, it gave your life meaning um, by holding on to it and using it as kind of a, a tool to shape yourself. Would you say that? Um, let me give you this example, real quick example. I had two patients back to back come to my office and they were doing construction around my office. Uh, so they had to walk far away to walk into the office. The first patient says, Dr. Bell, what's up with this, man? You know, I had to walk a mile to see you. They're doing all this construction. It's so messed up. Second patient came and said, oh, this is great. Um, I get to see you. And I was able to walk a mile at the same time. I got my steps in. This is mm -hmm. awesome. Like, I got two birds, one stone. So they both had the, the same experience, but because of their mind, one experience was like a waste of time. The other experience was like a great thing, more efficient experience for them. So um, they both had the same kind of physical experience. They, because of their own evolution, um, they created different meanings out of it. That person that spit on me, I'm sure it was meaningful for that person too in a different way. Um, what I mean by meaningful experiences, what I, I, what I think I mean is, are you using your experience to evolve to a different place? Mm. Um, we're, we're all human, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, just like the person that's making that crack pipe. But if I'm reading about a species that died three million years ago, and I'm able to think about that in perspective of my own species, I would say that's more meaningful to me. It gives me a greater kind of insight to the greater universe um, than someone that's making a crack pipe right. um, at the age of 16. You know, like mm -hmm. to me, I'm, I'm, I'm able to peel back the re reality of nature a little bit deeper um, um, when I'm able to consider that, you know, um, not judging that person that's making a crack pipe. I'm just saying, like, um, I think there's a difference um, in being able to appreciate some great vinyl from River West than blowing your mind out with crack mm -hmm. down in Carroll City. So don't yeah. do crack, kids. Yes. Also, my computer has 5% battery, so I'm going to stop recording. Okay. <laughs>